Wow, okay. Hello and welcome. Happy Friday, everybody. It's really, really great to, to see you here on Zoom. Um, before we get started, I want to welcome everyone to today's event. My name is Nicole Dowd, Halcyon's Director of Arts Programs. I'm joining you here from Washington, DC, which is the traditional territory of the Piscataway, the Nacotchtink and the Anacostan peoples. And today and every day, we recognize their legacy and gratitude. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, it's really great to see some new and familiar faces um, on Zoom. Last month, the artists of Cohort 4 presented some short overviews of their artistic practices to the wider healthy and community. And today, we're excited to kick off this series of conversations and studio visits as we really get to spend more time with each fellow. Today, Jessica Valores and Jamal Abrams will be presenting a collaborative work which represents the creative practice of play as well as uh, they'll be sharing content and dialogue around their respective creative explorations. Um, it's really an opportunity to bring a bit of the studio to you all, especially since we can't yet welcome you all back into the Arts Lab. Um, so a little bit about today's program flow before we dive right in. Um, after we screen, today's collaborative video work, Jessica and Jamal will spend a little bit of some time talking about their individual practices and sharing more about their creative processes and conversation. We encourage you to post any questions that you might have for them in the chat throughout today's program. And during this portion, we'll be keeping everyone's mics on mute. So please remember to, to mute your mics um, so that we can best hear the artists in today's presentation. And if you run into any technical issues during today's event, you can always pop your question in the chat and someone from the Halcyon, Halcyon team will be able to help you out. Towards the end of the program, you'll also have the opportunity for some live Q&A. And for that section, you can use the raise hand button in the participant section of Zoom and we will go around in order and we'll be able to unmute you and you can have a dialogue with the artist. So to share a little bit about today's artist, Jessica Valores is a multidisciplinary installation artist. Inspired by Afrofuturism, metaphysics, and historical memory, Jessica builds installations and experiences that are sacred, intentional, and activated, weaving together sound collage, painting, sculpture, and facilitated ritual. She creates portals, which are immersive environments that serve as a catalyst for collective healing and create space for affirmative self-expression and redefinition. Informed by her Black American and Jewish ancestry, she holds an emphatically multidimensional worldview, which is reflected in her vividly eclectic visuals and dynamic installations. She's currently working on a body of work called Black Fugitive Folklore, a series of mixed media sound installations that lift up a cosmology of Black fugitivity, um, which she will dive into much more during today's session. And then, also really happy to have Jamal Abrams here today. He is an interdisciplinary artist born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. He earned his BFA in dance from the University of Arts. Um, he has worked with Tariq Darrell and the UNAM Dance Collective, House of Bambi, as well as Sleep No More in New York City. As a choreographer, he has received the 2018 New Releases Commission recipi at, recipient at Dance Place here in DC. As an educator, he has had the opportunity to teach at the Baltimore County Public School Choreography Showcase, as well as Dance Fest in Shanghai. Within youth development, he has also had the opportunity to serve as the junior staff member at Lumberyard. So thank you so much to Jessica and Jamal for putting all of this together this afternoon. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about, about your work and conversation. And thank you all again for tuning in. So with all of that, Ed, let us get started. Begin with a song, a hush, a dream. Begin with a scar above your right eye, a star below the horizon, an ash cake you leave in the woods. Begin with flight, dance, motion, 
movement. Begin with the body, the borderland. Begin with a grain of salt and sweet water, an eclipse, a hole in the sun. Begin with another way out and in, a bead, a berry, a piece of moss, a clearing. Begin with a tree trunk, a steamboat, a whisper, a head nod. Begin with a path, an orbit unseen, a binary code forward. Begin with an inside, outside, in between. Begin with a return. Begin with a way beyond, a way of being, a way of becoming again. when she was a girl, when she was good, oh, she 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 brought me Mississippi. When she was a girl, that 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 one old woman run off. She did run off to beat her, so she run off. And every night she slip home, and somebody have her something to eat, something to eat. And she get that vittles, and going back in the woods, going back stay in the woods. If the star run down in the western hills, you ought to watch that star, see I run. Every boy, watch that star, see I run. Oh, watch that star. children, we had to give the children something, which no way was after all given to us, but we had to learn how to translate it, because your children moving in a very different world than the one in which I grew up, but you won't know anything about it at all, or the world in which you grew up, which would be remote for him, and yet he comes out of it, and has got to carry it much further than you or I will be able to carry it. He's got to have respect for it, but not be trapped by it. Precisely. So you had to give both give it to him and liberate, it, liberate him from it. Watch that star, see I run. If the star run down in the western hills. Western society will see me as flesh like a bone. For us, yes, all those are there. But more importantly, there is spirit. Death is not the end, it's but the beginning of longer life. Eternity, it's rituals are quite complex. They are meant to guide the spirit. Going wherever it is going, thanks to some constellation, our forefathers watch were starting the stars. Oh, watch that star, see I run. If the star run down in the western hills, you ought to watch that star, see I run.
Maybe if we could all take a deep breath here. And release. Um, we didn't we didn't really plan what we were, <laughs> how we were gonna talk about this, um, but I feel like every time I, I watch that, I just need to breathe a little deeper. Um, thank you, Jamal, for your movement and um, just exploring this, this piece and this um, story with me. Um, I don't know if you wanna say anything about it. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> um, it, was, it was nice to kind of be in a place and Jessica, you can echo or share your thoughts as well, but it was nice to be in a place to play without any high risk. Um, so being able to create something and share without it being this need of product or this, this forced nature of trying to create something. Um, and so it was just nice to have the time to do that. I think for me, as far as my, my creative practice intersecting with the work, um, Jessica talked a lot about portals which is what a lot of my work is rooted in, is using play as a pedagogical and choreographical practice to transcend and to shift into different realities. Um, and so it was really nice to kind of have that paired with Jessica's score. Um, I don't know if y'all saw that, but Jessica made the score and it, it has so much information and it offers so many opportunities um, for interpretations and ways to see and interact with it. So. Yeah, I think um, in a lot of ways that what you're doing with play and movement is what I'm thinking about with sound. It's like, how can, how can the sound of elders' voices, of archival interviews, of music, of rhythm, of like particular, you know, the sound of water from the Great Dismal Swamp or water from the Atlantic Ocean, how that, that has, those sounds have a memory or, or have an energy to them that can tell a story and create another way of knowing and experiencing. Um, and something when I was watching it this time, what I was thinking about was just the relationship between memory and imagination and the way that the way that we remember is actually an act of creativity and an act of imagination. Um, and just in, in speaking, in knowing a little bit about your practice, um, and maybe you can speak to this, Jamal, was just thinking about the way that dance and movement allows you to explore a, a, a way of being or a time or an idea um, in a way that we might not be able to read in a book or experience. Like it's kind of like entering another dimension of knowing. Um, yeah. yeah I'm really interested in that and how that's also connected to, to sound, to material, to nature. Yeah. Yeah, I think personally for me, I think of my body as, as, the, as the landscape. And so I think the way that I participate in movement is like my body is the, my, my teleportation device. Um, and I was listening to an album and this woman said, imagination is how children travel. And I was like, yes, yes, that is how that, 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 is how that work is done. And I, and I think especially when you, when you put these things into a soundscape and yes, it's very specific information and very specific sounds that hold histories what is it then to take my body and try to grab at whatever of it I can? You know, what, like, what is it to even try to see the bird that I hear in the background? What is it to try and feel the textures of the grass and kind of transport myself in that way? And thinking of how to create a, a full bodied experience through performance and kind of shifting the, shifting the idea of performance. Sometimes I think performance gets a really uh, negative rap sheet uh, as far as like living in the experience and living in the moment. But I, I think even in this experiment, we really began to play with that. It's like, how is this thing kind of rooted in performance, but also how are we sharing real life experiences at the same time? And, and how do they flash and shift? You know, just as that sound score goes through its different transitions and so does my body and so does the way that I see that landscape and it continues to reimagine itself. Um, as that score is playing. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. I feel like that's something that I've been um, thinking about in terms of my process with mixed material, like mixed media and um, installation and building 
um, just building structures and and putting like kind of collaging materials together. Um, and something that I've been leaning into is just like allowing allowing the materials to to reveal to me what I'm supposed to do rather than trying to mastermind like, oh, here's what I'm building. This is what it's going to be. But, but really allowing the creative process to be an, uh, a practice in listening and being like, okay, this is this is what I feel curious about or, or called to do or or is is asking me to explore this this certain type of like ripping paper apart and then reattaching it and then making it a bird and then ripping it again and then layering it like and so when I think when I think I've arrived at a thing and then the next thought is like oh actually no you're still in process <laughs> like this this has a journey in and of itself and it'll continue to reveal itself can you one one thing that I'm going to ask you about is kind of like the subconscious and how that plays like a huge role in what shows up like I think especially for me with the work that I do with play and imagination like so for example I do a lot of lip syncing and I do a lot of lip syncing because it's a really easy way to like transform into something else it's like a really like a, a training method almost to kind of build those bridges and those pathways. But what I've realized is that the things that come up is mainly from my subconscious, like things begin to bubble up that I wasn't even aware of. I was like, oh, I actually feel this way or oh, I haven't processed that thing or like, oh, this is actually tied to something else. And I, I, I think the way that you play in relation to that too leaves space for like, I love that I never know what's going to happen when I start any kind of process. So if you could talk a little bit about subconscious. Yeah. And what should oh, I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> um, I think, so one thing I did this summer, I took the whole month of August, inspired by the Black August tradition to really just be in immersive study and ritual around Black fugitivity. So I was reading like all types of books, listening to talks, um, doing genealogical research, going to the water, like just, you know, making sure I was connected uh, to the land and, and our planet allies. Um, writing down, like just writing a lot, being in conversation with people that, that could be in the, the conversation, like could allow me to reflect on what I was processing. Um, and something that I did at the beginning of August was just, I made this map of how I could study in, an, in a holistic way. So I was thinking about like, what does study look like for my mind? What does study look like for my body, for my emotional self, for my spiritual self? And I had like different practices in each of those quadrants. And, and those practices kind of created these other ways of knowing for me. So like one of them is singing and I'll just start, I like, I spend time, I have altars around my home. Um, and just spiritual spaces that I sing to and just allowing and it's like a freestyle it kind of like comes out as like a blues work song like I don't know who it is it's not Jessica but like something comes out of me that's like that has something to, to share with me um, so singing dancing like I started going for these walks I would walk to, to the water but I would have headphones in and I like, I would make playlists of, um, there's like a, a particular uh, genre of music. They would be considered slave songs, but they were it, like, they were kind of resurrected after emancipation by the children, the descendants of enslaved black folks um, who were like re remembering these songs. And um, so I would, I would just listen to those songs and start dancing and like whatever movement was coming from my body was like, okay, that's interesting. What is this telling me right now? Or I wouldn't even think about it and just allow it to, to flow. Um, so yeah, singing, dancing. Um, I also have a practice of making these like micro paintings. So I make these like really small paintings out of uh, recycled cardboard and like found objects. So like if I'm going for a walk and I see something interesting on the ground, I'm like, okay. I'll stitch that onto a painting or I'll figure out a way to, to weave it in. Um, and those things, I, I didn't exactly know what they were for, but as I'm like, as the vision for what this body of work is, is becoming clearer. And the, like, the more I just like take each next step, I'm like, oh, that's what the micro painting was for. Oh, that song, like, um, 
uh, the song that y'all heard in that in the soundscape it goes, watch that star, see how I run. And that song has been like blowing my mind just around like the relationship between fugitivity and the stars and like our planetary allies and like Nat Turner, like the rebellion, he like the sign for the rebellion was he saw a hole in the sun. And weeks prior, he had seen an eclipse, like, and just like understanding, like there, there's another way of knowing and being in relationship to the planet and the cosmos that our ancestors have always been, been in tune with. And so when that, when that um, song came up, because the song is about someone who's escaping, right? But it's also like, it's also about the planets. And yeah, so I feel like there's so many different um, uh, ways that ways of knowledge and ways of knowing and experience the world get integrated. And it's like transcends past, present, future. Um, and lastly, I'll say my dreams. Like I write down, I have a practice of writing down my dreams every day, if I remember them. Most of the time I try and remember them. Um, but there have been some things that'll come up, like a vision or an idea or just like a, oh, this is what I need to do with this material or something I can play with that I think is, is the subconscious working out, like working out the knowledge, like trying to understand, well, what's the medicine here? What's the wisdom here? Like what, what is synthesizing? So yeah, thanks for asking that question. I love talking about, about No, nope, go back off of that. Like I think, like thinking of, I think of play as a pedagogical and choreographic choreographical practice. And I think of the fantastical as all the realities that we wish were happening. Mm. And when you pair those things together, like most of my work is made from my dreams. Like most of my work is what, what when I go to sleep and what happens in those spaces, because that's when I actually get to experience the landscapes that I play with in this reality. Mm. And so I, like, I, I definitely echoing that, support that. And I think like, we both have such a clear passion with like youth and young people and how to pass that information and how to create spaces for that. Um, me personally, I'm working on programming called the Play Space, which is a way to shift dance and dance and dance performance training, but to put it in a safer, more accessible space for black and brown kids. And so I, I think the thing that I realized in my career with dancing was like, oh, this is all play. Like this is this is all just really high paid play. Like you, you, are, you are getting paid a great amount of money to explore and to make decisions and to have agency over yourself. But when we begin to look at those things and we look at the communities that actually get to interact with that information, there's a great deficit amongst black and brown children. And so I think, you know, the thing for me is how can, like how can we play, but also play at your own risk? Mm. And even in this imaginative landscape, like, yeah, there's so much fun, but there's also risk in taking on these forms and kind of transforming into these beings. And so that's me, but if you could <laughs> talk- Yeah, no, I think that's so important because I think there's also a way that, that black play gets criminalized or gets policed and and has always, like there's a lineage of that, right? So even within like what I'm exploring with Black Fugitive Folklore, it started with an exploration of these runaway slave ads that were posted in the, mostly in the 18 and 1900s. And there's like, there's a database now where they've been trying to um, digitize these ads as a way to um, have like a record, an archive for academic and genealogical purposes. But something that keeps coming up is like, um, just the relationship between like captivity, basically, like, like how black movement is, is constrained. And so you, you see runaway slave ads from enslavers. And then you also see who are, you know, who are trying to find, you know, catch their property, get, they keep the, the term, like, let me please find them so I can come get, get them. Um, but then you also see half of them are from uh, sheriff's departments that are just picking up black folks and being like, who, who does this person belong to? Like, come pay your fees and collect your, your property. Um, and so just, just thinking about the ways that like any type of black movement or, um, travel or, um, yeah, the, like, like free, <laughs> free movement is, is, um, and 
yeah, I guess enclosure is the word. It's like, it has to make sense in this particular way. And one of the things that I've been researching is marinage practices in the United States. And there's a lot of like, um, just new academic scholarship around how marinage um, existed here. And for those who are not familiar, marinage is the practice of someone who is enslaved escaping their enslavement. Um, and for some that was folks leaving and like going north or going into the swamps or the woods or the mountains. Um, but for a lot of people, it was uh, leaving a plantation to go to another one to find their family and, and about like 50% of folks who were escaping enslavement were, were escaping to reconnect with their either their children or their loved ones or their mothers or fathers. And they would they would basically create like camp in the woods and the borderlands of plantations. And so you think about this marginal space like right outside of captivity, but it's still like a space where you have to navigate really, um, really carefully but it makes me think about what you were just saying about risk. Like, what are the risks we take on the margins in order to create a life that feels livable or feels um, like we have some level of autonomy, even if it's like policed and, and, and um, confined in this particular way. And the play that is involved in, in being able to live in that way and figure out how to make a home out of a piece of moss or a tree trunk or, you know what I mean? And it's, it's so interesting to think about like the way that you use that work and the way that it parallels in a different way with my practice, like thinking of like thinking of Bojangles and like vaudeville and minstrelsy and how these mm. like how these very clear parameters were built. But they were also built and then we were able to navigate and operate in them with this false sense of like this false sense of. So like this idea that I'm participating in the thing, I'm doing the thing, but it's it's still controlled within this really clear box. Like um, with uh, Shirley Temple, I'm sure everyone is familiar <laughs> with Shirley Temple. Um, but there's like, there's again, we were talking about this. Like there's this one image when there's like Shirley Temple, there's Bojangles and there's two little black kids literally sitting and watching. And it goes into, Miriam G. Petty goes into this, uh, topic on holy obliviousness and how like who gets to participate and who gets to who gets to have access to this thing and so it's also a thing of like sh taking our bodies and shifting them out of the white gaze and performance like how do we begin to acknowledge the ways that our experiences were crafted by another and then how do we look at that information retell that story and tell it with its integrity its honesty and it's grit and so many other things that the thing is full of. So, mm -hmm. and that goes back to when you were talking about uh, that work that you did with those names and how it turned, like how that thing began to transform. Even in my practice, you know, that created the imagery for me of just like names washing through my body. And so these, these things are present and they, they have histories and they have information. Um, like even in a play space or imagination, how those things still fill you or how you still gain access to things that you weren't even there to experience. Mm. <laughs> I know, I felt like I was just like, bah, 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 no, it's, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so good. It's so good. Um, for me, it's like, you know, we're, we're, we're continuing a legacy of, of just like, of creative innovation and like, how, like deconstructing and reconstructing. It's like, this is what we're given. How do we, how do we create medicine out of it? How do we create possibility out of it? How do we create another way of existing out of it? Um, even if we know, you know, like what's up against us, <laughs> that, that, that practice, like there's a legacy of that. Like it had, like that's the thing that sustains and makes possible a future that we can live into. Echoing, agreed and supported. <laughs> um, I don't know, Nicole, do we want to take questions, maybe? Questions? You know, I could just listen to you both just be in dialogue with one another. I, I think it's really, so it's, it's, it's really, I, and something that I, I didn't mention, and maybe we didn't mention either, is that you share a studio at Halcyon. Um, and so your, your practices coming into the program, right, were like, 
pretty pretty different from one another is um Jamal being mostly focused around dance and choreography and Jessica really involved in this more community um centered work um and then and now you share a studio and and you're having these explorations with one another um and so you know how how has that kind of how has that really developed? And I know that, you know, we, we paired you all together. And so this was something that was really more like, like an assignment almost. Um, but, you know, other than, than being in, in the, having to produce this work or produce this artist talk, how has being in the same studio space started to, to shift and shape the conversations and even your own practices? I actually think our practices are really similar. Like Jamal does a lot of youth work. That's my my professional background is in youth work, and um, and yeah. So I, and I think just the play space, the practice space, the idea of showing up to an idea with questions and just like let's see what happens uh, is something that that I value in, in my in my practice also. And so if anything, I think it's just been kind of like, we can just like wax poetic about like, yeah, you do that? Yeah, I'm with that too. Let me try that. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think the work that we do, it, it, it intersects often. Like it like, it's like, do, do, do this way, this way, this way. But I think also what's been really nice is that through uh, like just genuine conversation and checking in, we like it leads to like this big discussion or it leads to me being like, all right, Jessica, I, I really got, okay, I'm gonna go. Or, like us like having these moments. And so I think that has been an amazing thing um, to have and to be a part of. One thing that I'm interested in Jessica and that we didn't really get to see, but this is just a question that I have is kind of like the way that you are thinking of movement and the way that you use movement. Um, is there anything, is there any, at any point do you feel like you would introduce that into your work? Yeah, um, um, yes. Uh, I think right now I'm, I'm, what I'm working on right now is actually building, uh, it's like part altar, part landscape, part map of cosmos, ocean, fugitivity. Uh, but uh, yeah, I have some ideas of like iterations of this work and something that I've just been kind of, as I've been in this immersive study, has have just been taking notes of like, what are marinage practices? Like, if I had to just like list what these practices are. Um, and for, the, for me, those feel very movement-based. Like, um, there's terms that come up a lot around lurking, harboring, conduction, um, root work, and all of that is like very active to me. So something that's actually come out of being in this particular studio space is that we have this one window that the sun just shines like, like it's, it's just like really potent sunshine, <laughs> but it creates this square on the floor that I've just been kind of like dancing with my shadow occasionally and um, yeah, sometimes I'll just like post like just like little bites of movement on um, on social media and stuff. But I think I do want to play with like, what is it playing with movement through my shadow? And so like not necessarily see me, seeing my body, but seeing the light and then like what stands in the way of the light and how that moves with sound um, that that kind of speaks to some of those those practices that for me feel very like larger than life. Like they're like kind of, they're very science fiction-y. Like when I wrote them all down, I was like, oh, wow. Like, yeah, our history is like speculative fiction. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, thinking about, I think I'm thinking about movement in that way. Um, and I will just say like my mixed media practice, like my practice is very much connected to my spiritual practice and like giving reverence to my ancestors. So there is like, there's like, you know, a daily, like I water the plants, I light the Palo Santo, I speak the names of my ancestors, I kneel, I walk around, like sometimes I'll like, I have some instruments, so I'll just like, you know, activate the space. So I think there's like movement that, that like informs the energy of the work. Like you, you're not going to see that when you experience it, but I do, I do uh, believe that you'll feel it in some way that there's like, 
that this this work has been infused like someone has lived around it you know and and prayed around it and and meditated around it and uh yeah i feel like that's all part of the sauce mm. when you say when you when you you just said like light and what's in between the light and your mm. like your love and interest for shadows that immediately made me think of shadow work mm. like like the necessity of that in order to even participate in our practice, at least, like at least for me, right now I'm working on a film that's serving as an anthology with like addressing black queerness and in intimacy, trans and intergenerational trauma, the black body and the white gaze, like, and I'm realizing that all of this work, I, I kind of have, I have to do my shadow work in order for me to even effectively experience the things that I'm trying to create. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think for me, like a good shadow work practice is uh, radical honesty. And so sometimes I just come into the studio and I really allow whatever to happen to my body. And I think sometimes that, that it's like, duh, that's what you do in a studio. But I think it's like a, it's almost like a heightened sense for when you go into a state of, like a new state of freedom and that you're really able to experience your body outside of any judgment or outside of even the things that you place on it. Um, so could you talk, do you have shadow work practices? Like what they look <laughs> No, like? I appreciate you sharing that because sometimes I think I'm someone who gravitates towards the light and I'm just like, ooh, you know, but like there's the, the underbelly of that too, right? Um, and actually in August, when I started this, like in the immersive study, like I like, I was like, I told my mom, she could only call me two times a week. Like I wasn't talking to people on a regular basis. Like I was really like in hibernation. And um, the first few questions that came up in that, in, in just sitting with fugitivity as a concept, like I, I hadn't even started like the readings and all of that stuff um, was who am I beholden to? what am I running from and what am I running towards? And a lot of what was coming up for me was like my own, the own, my own things internalized knit things around identity. And so thinking about queerness, thinking about mixedness, thinking about my Jewish ancestry, thinking about um, accountability, thinking about like, what does it mean that I have ancestors who were both enslaved and enslavers? You know what I mean? Like, all of that messy, like, <laughs> I wish I could just come to the table and be like, y'all made it through. Yeah, you know what I mean? But even, even, those, even those who kind of like, I don't know how this is gonna sound, but it's kind of like this way that we make victimhood righteous. And it's like, actually I come to the table and honor my ancestors for every decision they made, even the ones that, that feel like they wouldn't have been in alignment, but like all the decisions that they had to make or, or weren't really choices that they could make, but, you know, so that they could exist, so that their children could exist, so that their children could exist, so that I could exist. And at some point, like come back to that and do this work so that it can heal whatever needs to be healed in that, in that legacy and, and clear whatever needs to come so that like my children don't have to deal with, with that inherited, um, those inherited traumas or internalized oppressions. And yeah, and for me, that's looking at both like the ways that I internalize oppression and the ways that, that I also internalize privilege um, and, and the complicity that's there as well. So yeah, I think that's the, some of the shadow work that I've been exploring. And I think movement for me has been really helpful in like just moving through and just being okay with, oh yeah, that exists in my body. Like, and it's okay. Like I can move it. I can sit with it. I can listen to it. Um, and then I can anchor in, I can anchor in what is it that I, that I want to manifest? What is it that I want, that I'm about right now, that I value right now? Um, and so can kind of like wrestle with it in that, from that standpoint. When you were talking about looking at, looking at, like looking at every decision that was made and accepting that, like, I think the thing that I've been taking a great interest in is, like, scope and lenses and really taking the time to sit in, sit in the fact that, like, right now there are, like, 800 different versions of me. 
running around this world, right? Like right now there are 800 different ideas of me or like mm -hmm. the way that I am as a person. And how do you, like, how do you kind of make space for that? And it also like accept these different, like these different relationships and these different narratives or the ways that you're viewed. Um, I think right now was, I'm making a film, uh, a part of the film where I embody my mother, my father and me and kind of just looking at how these things got to me, right? And I'm, I'm a big believer in saying that doesn't belong to you, which is how I address trans and intergenerational trauma. Yeah. It's like when you, when you realize that things are in your body that you, actually, no, this doesn't belong to me. And I, I, I can look at it and say that this doesn't belong to me and give it back but, <laughs> or remove it. But a really interesting thing is that my, my father passed when I was eight and so creating this work around him is that I'm being forced to look at him through like seven different lenses. And so I'm taking the information of what I know from him of eating ice cream and that pretty much being the only meal because dad was dad. <laughs> um, and then looking at it through the relationship of my mother's experience and then looking at it through the relationship of my sister's experience. And so do you feel like sometimes when you're creating as well, like you're, you're looking through or you're creating through a specific lens or through a scope? Mm. It's hard for me to step into like another person's lens because I'm still I'm still at the point where I'm like trying to understand who this other person is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I've been doing a lot of genealogical research and at some point it gets real muddy and murky and it's like, even when I like get more information, that little bite of information actually then creates a whole swamp that I'm like, I have no idea what this is now. Like this summer I was um, going through like ancestry.com and like constructing a family tree, connecting with other people who I'm in relationship with. And um, so like kind of like building this knowledge and there's so many like more digitized documents now, like from the Freedmen, Freedmen's Bureau. So there's just more information and at one point, I had had this dream about my indigenous ancestry. And later in like a few weeks later, was able to connect um, one ancestor, Joseph Quarles, to this particular um, nation called the, the Pamunkey in Virginia. And all of it was like, there was no one piece of paper that could verify that that was true. But there was like, there was this dream that I had, and then there was this, like, this tree that suggested that this was a descendant of this particular family. And so for me, it's like, I, I think your idea of having like 800 selves, I'm like, I'm looking at this one person, Joseph Quarles, like he could be like 500 different people. Like, was he, you know, I don't know. I just don't know. And so it's, um, yeah, it's hard for me to like put myself in the lens and I just have to kind of accept that like, it's kind of a blur. Like they're, they're just gonna be like this elusive um, presence, but I think just the practice of calling their name and continuing to, to invite them into this process will reveal whatever is supposed to reveal for me. Does that, mm. yeah, that's kind of how I'm, how I'm approaching it. Mm -hmm. And I had like, at one point, like I found the name of two enslavers of my family who are also my family. You know what I mean? Like they are in my blood, in my DNA. And I had to make this decision around like, do they go on my altar? Like, do I put their names on, on my altar? And ultimately I decided to, I couldn't do that for their whole families. Like I, I haven't gotten there yet to accept that. But I think something I do believe is that our ancestors are working on our behalf on the other side and that they're not foreign to each other. Like that they, they actually want to write, or I hope that they want to write the wrongs that existed here and can be allies in, in this work and in exploring Black fugitivity and working towards Black liberation. Like, that's what I'm calling on them for their help for, you know? But I think that's also a part of like, and I, I think of this, and we talked about this as well, as like a conjuring. And yes. so I think of like, no, I can't no, I can't change this reality. Like, no, I can't change this reality, but I can create worlds and landscapes that offer another one. And I feel like the, the power that lives in that is, is like, it's a conjuring. It's like once you create 
once you create that thing, now it lives in the world, which means that now it's a possibility and now that now it's an option. Um, and I think that is like the essential legacy of Maroons in the United States. Like for people to, dis for a person to decide, I'm going to, to, to risk everything, like everything, not only risk their own livelihood and their, their bodies, but also when somebody leaves a plantation, when they escape a plantation, they put everybody else on that plantation at risk too. So they're also, you know, putting their families at risk, like people who might have been complicit, which everybody, I mean, Black folks have been looking out for each other for a long time. Like we've been like, there were networks of complicity that were like extensive across state lines. And um, so for somebody to leave, to leave that, to take all the risks to leave that and decide I'm not going to live in a white dominated world or in a world where, where you know, racial capitalism is the reality and decide to to make it in the woods, in the swamps, in the mountains, underground. Like people actually built underground structures and had like generations of people living underground. And so for somebody to decide like, this plantation reality is not for me and this idea of freedom is not for me either. And I'm gonna create another thing. Like I think that is what I'm like really drawn to in, in studying and, and just like honoring that legacy. Cause it's like, you know, we just had an election. It's like, I ain't for this. And I ain't for that neither. Like we need to dream beyond and, and that's gonna take some sacrifices, but there are, there are examples of ways that that's happened and there are tools and spiritual practices and ways of being that can like, that can support us in really visioning the kind of worlds that we wanna see where like actual liberation is possible and we're not settling for, for what we think we can get, you know? I'm going to take a really like campy detour really quick. Okay. <laughs> Just to like quote something, but I was watching uh, Jingle Jangle on Netflix. It's like this new Christmas movie. And <laughs> um, y'all, that's me. That's just where my mind is all the time. So <laughs> it's okay. a new Christmas movie. And, you know, it comes around this whole thing of like this toy becoming like, like the toy maker cannot experience a toy because he doesn't believe in the toy. Like he doesn't believe that this 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 idea fantastical actually exists, and so the thing doesn't act. And so that was just a way to support that idea of like it's one thing to have an idea, but it's also like this this thing of like belief that seems so childlike and so like yeah, like I believe it, but it's actually a practice. Like believing is actually a practice. Like taking the time to put faith into something and to believe that it can create light is a practice in itself. Mm. Yes, there's actually, there's a quote that I love from this book called The Fifth Sacred Thing by Starhawk. And the quote says, um, and I might be butchering it a little bit, but it goes along the lines of, all wars are first waged in the imagination and ways to limit what we think is possible. And so I think just the practice of play, visioning, dreaming, like existing in another reality before it actually materially exists is, is a visionary practice, is a revolutionary practice, is a practice of liberation. Which is this thing that like, as far as like you, right? Like we're, we're talking about the kids, the nuggets, as I usually <laughs> refer, to, refer to them as, but like this, this like pre-conventional, conventional and post-conventional way of thinking. And so like how, like, it's kind of like how we're shifted and we're, we're crafted to be in this like space. But like Kohlberg was like, there's only 20% of people that will actually get to post-conventional thinking, which is thinking that you navigate the world based on your own personal beliefs and like your own personal thoughts, which in some ways feels like, like the unreachable, like to be able to make decisions without a societal impact, but then another aspect of that kind of becomes the most enlightened self. Like the fact that you're able to stand in these thoughts and these ideas mm -hmm. firmly without a societal input, uh, input or pressure on top of that. Mm. I'm gonna interject for a quick second. Just, we have a couple, we actually have a couple audience questions. Um, so I wanna make sure that we get to them. Um, and I'm going to like bring us back into talking about this ancestral practice that we were on a little bit. And it looks like uh, Carrie Adams says that this work reminds them of revivals that includes both awakening, rooting out and breaking down the space between this plane and the ancestral and spiritual plane. 
do either of you feel like you've already done this work or are you continuing the work of someone else in your lineage or doing this work in a slightly different way on another timeline? Wow. <laughs> you first, Jamal. <laughs> Shout out to that question. Uh, um, I think for me, um, and this is something that I feel in my dance and when I was talking to Jessica about this, I, I, um, I genuinely believe that my gift doesn't belong to me. Um, I believe that I'm the vessel for my gift and for the way that I tell these stories, but I don't believe that I have ownership. Um, and a lot of times when I'm in my practice, when I'm working in these kinds of ways, I feel things into my body and I, and I, and I, and I, I feel that energy and it's clearly not mine and it clearly doesn't necessarily belong to me in that right, but it is a part of me. And so I, I think for me personally, it's, I'm, I'm doing my leg of the race. And when I say that, it's thinking of it from an ancestral standpoint. And I think that we all have a leg of the race to participate in. And so if we're thinking about from that lineage, I am doing my leg of the race. So I feel connected and I feel a part of, but it also feels singular and, and curated by me, um, but it's a part of this greater thing. Yeah, I think, um, well, there's two things that are coming up for me. One is around listening and just like listening for what's there, listening for also my own assumptions. Like I think part of this exploration for me has also been like just wrestling with my mixed identity. And when I started doing genealogical research, I was just like, oh, I ain't the first one in my family. You know, I've had like black Indians who was mixed with white you know, French Huguenots and like, there's like all types of, of configurations of me that have existed before. And so I think for me, this practice is also just like listening. Yeah, just listening, like who, who are these people? Like who, who are the people that like actually live within my DNA? Um, and so, yeah, it's like, yeah, I've been here before, but then I'm like also in this new configuration that that is informed by these, you know, different spiritual practices that can can allow me to explore or like find the medicine in a new way that maybe wasn't revealed earlier, or maybe was, and now we have to like refine it or like re reconnect to it. Um, yeah, I feel like there's so much more there. <laughs> well, and also I think thinking about like the importance of having, you know, thinking about the conversations that I've had generations ago into the present time and like how this like level of vulnerability might then affect and be more in beneficial in future conversations as well. So like all of these yeah. different timelines that are playing into this. Um, there there was, another... Can I share this story? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so I went to visit some of my elders in uh, South Carolina this summer to interview them and, and also just to share some of the research I've been doing and to like verify, cause like there's things on paper and then there's things that are like, oral tradition. You just gotta, you just gotta listen. <laughs> you just gotta be at the dinner table and be like, so what happened there? Who is this person? Oh, that, that person actually is a cousin, like things that are not recorded or, you know, not, uh, necessarily, uh, what do you, yeah, documented. So, um, I was one of the stories that my uncle tells almost every time I go to visit him, he's my great uncle. So he's my grandmother's sister, uh, brother. And Uncle Tommy tells this story of Epsi Brunson, who was his grandmother, and how one of uh, her children uh, basically uh, was walking down the street. This white man, uh, he didn't move out of the way of this white man. The white man slaps him, and this black man cuts him. And his, his name is Uncle Son. So Uncle Son cuts this white man. And immediately they have to send Uncle Son to Florida. He can never come back to Somerton, South Carolina. Like he has to go to Florida because otherwise the clan's gonna be after him. And that night they gather everybody in the family. So all the Brunsons and all the Browns, they have them armed in trees, like ready for the clan to come to the house and mess with them. And the story is that Epsi Brunson goes out with a shotgun. She like goes out onto the main street and she, um, let me make sure I get this right. Uh, she said, it's, it's something along the lines of, and I have this recorded, it's actually in one of the soundscapes, but it's something along the lines of, she's like screaming down the street with this shotgun in her hand. These streets will be paved in blood if anybody puts a hand on my children. 
And for me, that was just like, okay, like that, that woman lives in me. Like I feel that, that sense of like protection, that sense of like gusto, that sense of like just deep love and courage. Um, and so that's something that that's like medicine for me to keep me encouraged. But then when I tease apart that story a little further, so I'm like, I'm like, well, who's Epsi Brown? Like, who's her family? And so when I come to find out another layer of the story is that F.C. Brunson's father is the white sheriff of the town that she's not claimed by, but everybody knows that that's his child and, and not, not by choice, not like, not her mother didn't decide that, you know what I mean? Like, um, but there is for me in just understanding that other layer was like, oh, she had a level of proximity to whiteness that allowed her to, to take that stance and also not get, not get attacked in this particular way. So then it, it complicates the story for me because then I'm also like, okay, how do I also use my privilege and my light skinness and my mixedness to defend black life, to fight for black liberation and also, but also to like, to, to, to sit with the reality of that too. Like it's, none of this is, is clean. Like none of this is, um, simple or, or like a black and white, black and white story, but it's like, all of these things are very complicated. Um, yeah. And so just sitting with, with all of that, all of the layers of that. That's really, I think it's a, like super, it is like the fabric of, of the history of, of being and existing here. Mm -hmm. Um, oh my gosh, we're like getting so close to time. There is one more question in the chat that I do want to get to, um, from, from, from Bancha, and it is for, for both of you. Um, and someone had also mentioned this in the comments when you were talking about the Marin community, but how much did you learn about the Marin community life during your studies in school? And did you learn all of this based on your own independent exploration and research? Um, and why do you think this unique, powerful history is not an integral part of the curriculum for kids even today? Um, and what's our responsibility as educators to teach that? There's a lot there, but... Um, I figure that it's a really important question to, to touch upon before we close out. I think this is literally Jessica's question. Um, so I'm gonna give my response. <laughs> no, didn't learn it in school. Wasn't taught because that information provides power and that's not how the education system is set up to operate. <laughs> um, and three, that information that I received was through my own personal practice and through honestly, Jessica. <laughs> so, uh, Jessica, hit it. Yeah, um, all I learned about in school was the Underground Railroad, barely, and a very, very whitewashed, um, uh, yeah, watered down version of what that was. Um, I studied Black history in. Uh, for undergrad, uh, Black history and education. And I think that was my way of kind of like trying to learn all the things I didn't learn K through 12 around like what it means to be Black in America and, and what, yeah, what we're living in. Um, but yeah, most of this was just from the study that I've been doing. Uh, I think there's more scholarship around it now, specifically around Maroon practices and communities and um, the way that Maranaj looks in the U.S., which is, which is, has some like clear distinctions from the way that it looks in other uh, like Caribbean or uh, Latin American countries, South American countries. Um, yeah. And I think, yeah, I think, yeah, power. That's why we not taught it because it's powerful. Like there's medicine here. There's, there's um, ingenuity here. There's another way here. And people don't want us to know that there's other ways or don't want us to be in the practice of like asking those questions. Um, so yeah, I think for me, this is like the study and, and studying in a way that's not just reading books, even though reading books is important, but studying as a way of being, like a way of being in nature, a way of, be, of listening to others, a way of listening to our bodies, a way of, of of thinking about how things connect in new ways. Um, I think those are practices that could really sustain movements for change and liberation and accountability. And um, yeah, I think the powers that be don't, that doesn't really serve, <laughs> doesn't really serve their agenda, so.
Uh, yeah, I think that's why this work is so important and lifting it up through art and through practice is a way for folks to like really understand it and sit with it and then experience it for themselves and go on their own journey and like, you know, research their own genealogy and, and think about who were the people that lived on the land that, that they're on right now before they even got here. Um, and yeah, so just asking more and more questions. Yeah. I think that's like, we could have a whole second hour talking about the systems of education and where that plays into your artistic practice, but we'll save that for another time. Because we have hit time and we could we could stay here for a very, very long time, but I do really want to thank both of you, Jessica and Jamal, for, for, for sharing and, you know, being, I think, super vulnerable in, in a, this kind of public forum. Um, and so I really appreciate both of you. Um, and I really appreciate everyone who's who's been here today. I think this has like been such a good way to start off this whole series. Um, we have two more upcoming virtual fellows conversations and studio visits. Um, there'll be one featuring Imogen Blue in Ayosa and Dova Lynn on December 4th and Fargo Tabaki and Swamp Daddy on December 11th. So I will post the links for those in the chat, but definitely, definitely sign up. Um, and then lastly, you may have already checked out our freshly launched end of year campaign all season. Our Why Health Theme campaign is really telling the story of how we got here, why we do this work and where we're going. Um, every week we're sharing stories from fellows and about our work. And this week's theme is, is access. And so for some of our fellows, access means studio space or, or, or housing without, without the worry about rent. And for others, it's an introduction to a mentor with a lot of years of experience or a connection to an industry leader. Um, so we're really here to provide them with that access, whatever it means to them. And so stay tuned for next week's theme, which is Launchpad. You can follow us on social media and follow along with, with all, of, all of these stories as we close out 2020. So again, Jamal, Jessica, thank you so, so much. If anyone wants to connect with them, we, we, can, we can make those personal connections. We are having some, some virtual studio visits one-on-one -on -one with them. And also, if you want to come in for a socially distant studio visit, um, Jessica has a lot more content within her studio to share. And, and yeah, so stay tuned. Thank you all. Thank you so much, everyone. And also, thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Jamal. Shoot. <laughs>